Thank you all very much for coming. We really appreciate you guys uh, taking the time out of your busy work schedules to come and join us for these uh, educational seminars. I know a lot of you guys took a long drive also, so thank you. We, uh, we appreciate it. My name is Yvonne Dresser. I've been working for Gusmer uh, for uh, almost a year now, and uh, I'm a sales rep. My territory is actually Sonoma County and Mendocino County as well. Um, I'll be giving you a talk today on micro, uh, microbial monitoring. Uh, my background really is wine microbiology. Before I was with Gusmer, I was with an artist of inquiry. I was their microbiologist for almost two years. Uh, and then before that, I was with the large Central Valley winery um, where I did work starting uh, anywhere from production to the lab to research and development as well, and bringing some of those research and development projects into, back into production. Um, so, so really, any micro questions, any wine microbiology, microbiology questions, I probably have uh, kind of dealt with them before and let me know. So first I'd like to start with a short introduction on, on why we should monitor for, for microbes in the winery. Why is it important? Why, why are we here today? And really, it wouldn't be, um, these educational seminars wouldn't be complete unless we're also talking about um, microbial monitoring. Um, you know, why, why do we do these things? It's, uh, it's because we're concerned about these microorganisms getting into our, our wines and, and causing um, spoilage. And then I'd like to um, focus on two different areas for this presentation, the first being uh, monitoring for micro in the lab. What can we do within our labs to test the wine um, to ensure that we um, are taking a proactive approach to, um, to reducing spoilage? And we'll be, I'll be suggesting a couple tools on how to do that, uh, some troubleshooting, and then I'll end that with a plating demo to show you how easy it is for us to be able to do the plating ourselves uh, within our winery. Uh, secondly, I'll be focusing on monitoring for microbes in the winery. So the winery itself uh, can also harbor these microorganisms and their um, surfaces that our wine comes into contact with. So areas that need to be sanitized. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll be talking essentially on tools on how to monitor the, win the winery, some best practices, and some common contamination points and, and troubleshooting as well. Lastly, I'll talk about some advances in rapid micro, um, specifically this um, system called the EasyFlow by Millipore. Um, really, really revolutionary kind of piece of equipment um, as compared to the traditional microbiology that we're all used to. So why should I monitor for microbes? Why are we here essentially? Um, monitoring gives us the chance to um, to take a proactive, preventative approach. It ensures that no contamination, it ensures no contamination of spoilage in our finished product. And essentially what that means is that when, you, when that product leaves your hands, when it leaves your warehouses, you can be sure that that product is gonna be the same uh, from when it left to when it gets to your consumer's hands. Um, no surprises in between, no, no re-fermentation, no off flavors and aroma that you didn't detect when it was first in your hands. If there is contamination, it allows us to determine what it is. Once we determine what it is, uh, you can find those contamination points within, um, within, your, um, within your winery. Monitoring for, for microbes in wine can also identify equipment failures. Uh, or inadequate sanitation procedures. So we might be going through the motions of our typical sanitation procedures, but you know, are we using the right chemicals? Are we doing that for long enough? Are, we, are, um, are the procedures um, being followed um, as they should be? Uh, swabbing, some of these techniques and tools that I'll be talking about allow us to, um, to identify whether that's working or not. It also allows us to identify contaminated product from good product. So essentially what this means is that, especially concerning the bottling line, for example, if you're sampling every hour and you come to a point where at uh, a certain time you start seeing contamination, we are then able to identify that product uh, before it came uh, into uh, contact with any spoilage organisms and after. So we're able to then separate the two 
and hold only the product that needs to be held and release that one, which we are confident um, hasn't come in contact with any spoilage organisms. Uh, wine microbiology, uh, I think, can deserve a, a talk on and of itself and, look, and going over the microbes and how to control them and, and what their uh, identifying characteristics are. But I'll focus on just um, a few of the common spoilage organisms. Um, first of all, lactic acid bacteria. And in that group are lactobacillus, enococcus, and pediococcus. We all definitely recognize enococcus as that which we intentionally add into our wine for malolactic fermentation. But in the cases where you don't want malolactic fermentation to occur, and if enococcus um, is present, that's a point at which this, um, this organism is essentially a spoilage organism. Second group, acetic acid bacteria. Most commonly uh, in this group is acetobacter. Uh, we can associate this with spikes in volatile acidity for the most part. Um, Acetobacter is ubiquitous. We can find it everywhere in the winery, in our wine, in our infrastructure. It's also very, very hard to, com to completely eliminate. We just have to find ways to control, uh, control its growth. Spoilage yeast is another category, and this includes Britannomyces. So, of course, Britannomyces. Uh, most commonly associated with, um, with uh, barrels and, uh, and, and aging, uh, any winery that ages their wine in, in barrels. Um, Saccharomyces is also a, a considered a spoilage organism, uh, especially uh, when it's unwanted, particularly uh, when uh, fermentation is, is unwanted, specifically, for example, in wine that is sweet, has some residual sugar. Um, Saccharomyces can lead to re-fermentation in bottle. Uh, zygosaccharomyces can also lead to re-fermentation in bottle. Zygo is commonly associated um, with wines that have um, any sort of concentrate added back into the, into the wine towards the end of the process uh, or right before bottling. Zygo is also one of those um, organisms that's very, very difficult to remove. You definitely don't want anything to do with zygo. So these organisms <coughs> are going to lead to the formation of off flavors and aroma. These off flavors and aromas are things that are very, very difficult to eliminate once they've already been formed. Uh, you know, the only option at that point is downgrading your wine or blending it away. Um, things that are going to impact the bottom line um, of your winery. Um, some of these off flavors are, or aromas are caused by um, things like 4-EP, 4-EG, 4-ethylphenol, 4 glycol So this is um, a chemical compound that is often described as um, barnyard, horse sweat, horse sweat. Um, and this is, uh, Britannomyces <laughs> is responsible for this guy right here. Volatile acidity, any large spikes in VA, um, and they can be traced back um, most commonly to Acetobacter, but most of the organisms do have um, the ability to, to produce uh, volatile acidity in, in one way or another. Uh, ethyl acetate is another compound that's going to um, affect the wine. And then, as I mentioned earlier, refermentation in bottle, um, as well as, uh, as haze in bottle. As little as one cell, one, sac one Saccharomyces um, in a bottle of wine that has some residual sugar can lead to refermentation. And then, in the worst of cases, pushing out the corks and exploding bag and boxes. So one way that we can take a preventative approach is to test our wine, um, specifically test the wine during aging, so that's in the barrels, in the tanks, um, and test wine samples post-bottling. Um, one question that I got earlier that, uh, that I'd like to point out is, is how much, uh, what's the volume? How much should we put through um, when we're testing for, uh, for wine? And I would say that it depends. If you're uh, filtering wine for bottled wine sterility, theoretically, if you've already filtered that wine uh, in your bottling, uh, bottling line, you shouldn't have anything growing in, uh, your, there shouldn't be the presence of any microorganisms. So you want a large sample. And typically, people um, in the lab will, will filter anywhere between 200 to 300 milliliters. 
When it comes to testing uh, wine samples from the cellar that are aging, typically, you know, they haven't been processed, you haven't filtered them, and there, may, there, uh, there will be some growth. As I mentioned, Acetobacter is pretty ubiquitous, you're gonna find it everywhere. So you want a smaller sample, so that when you do plate, your, your plates uh, aren't overgrown with so many bacteria and yeast that you can't get a real count, or you aren't able to, uh, to uh, identify the organisms. So a couple of tools um, that can help you test your wine for uh, microorganisms are the vacuum. Um, this is a nice, quiet vacuum uh, right here, um, made by Millipore, or you know any, any microbes such as the one sitting here at the table uh, is gonna work for you. You'll need a manifold. Uh, in this case, you've got a stainless steel manifold. Um, you can have something that looks like this, or even uh, something as simple as that glass Erlenmeyer flask. You'll need a membrane, media, an incubator for your plates, and the microscope to be able to make the identification. So you don't need a whole lot of equipment, um, and it also doesn't take a lot of time to do this. It's something that can be easily set up in your winery, depending on um, the budget that you have and depending on the number of samples that, you, that you're processing. So first, as I mentioned, manifolds, three main types. Uh, glassware, so you can have something as simple as an Erlenmeyer flask hooked up to your vacuum. Uh, often you want a two Erlenmeyer flask setup so that one of them catches, um, catches any, any uh, wine coming through so it doesn't get into your vacuum. Uh, you've got the traditional stopper, which is this one right here with the uh, number eight stopper right there, or the microfill, which is this one right here, uh, and I have an example of it right up at the top. As I mentioned, these choices all depend on your budget. You can, um, you know, the glass Erlenmeyer flask doesn't cost a whole lot to bring into your winery, but you're only able to process one sample at a time. So if you're processing multiple samples, those bottled wine sterilities can really start stacking up if you're um, grabbing line samples every hour uh, or every shift. Then you'd want a manifold that's much larger that can process multiple samples at a time. And, uh, and a membrane. The important thing in, uh, when we're talking about membranes is uh, that they be 0.45 micrometer. These are mixed cellulose ester membranes, and they typically come pre-sterilized, at least these millipore um, membranes come pre-sterilized in um, individually wrapped form or in an S-pack that can be loaded onto, um, onto this, um, the system right here, so that all you have to do is press the lever, and out comes the membrane. You don't have to work with, uh, you know, put your tweezers down and, and open up the individually wrapped membrane. It is important to mention to uh, to have it be sterile. So spend the extra couple dollars and, and get the the sterile version. The idea behind the membrane is that you'll filter your wine through the membrane the organisms are going to, to remain on top, and this is then going to be placed on your auger uh, or, or media and incubated. Um, at, uh, typically, you want incubation uh, temperature of about anywhere between 28 and 30 degrees, and depending on what organisms you are, um, you are growing, it's gonna be anywhere between five to seven days. Um, yeast are a lot faster to grow, but Yeasts such as um, Britannomyces are gonna take longer, five to seven days, as well as uh, um, the lactic acid bacteria and the acetic acid bacteria. You'll need media, and you also have a couple options here. Um, first and uh, option is anything that's dehydrated in a powder form or granular form. This is a very low cost uh, option. No refrigeration is needed of this powdered form and it has a very long shelf life as well. Um, you can add auger to it to solidify that, that media uh, and then pour into your plate. So pretty much what you're doing here is mixing water along with the media, autoclaving the media, pouring your plates and uh, letting them dry and placing the membrane on top of those plates. 
Another option is the selective liquid ampules. So that's these guys right here. What these are are essentially single doses of pre-sterilized liquid media that gets placed onto a, um, a petri dish that has a pad to absorb some of the, um, some of the media, uh, some of the liquid media. The ampules come in um, WL, yeast and mold, Britannomyces, MRS broths. So any of the selective medias that you need can also be found in the, in the liquid ampules. And it makes it really easy. You don't have to have an autoclave. So if you don't have an autoclave, that's, that, this is a solution for you. Um, they're very convenient because their shelf life um, is also pretty extended as opposed to um, plates that have already been poured. These are gonna start uh, drying out within about a week or two, um, whereas the liquid ampules are just placed in the refrigerator and taken out as needed. Sure. Okay, if you make your own media, you obviously have more media than if, when you use the ampule. Yes. Is that making a difference? Um, it's in not. Your, in your recovery of, of microorganisms? It's not. So the two milliliters is adequate for, um, for growth on that 47 um, millimeter uh, petri dish. And then when you're, when you're pouring the plates yourself, um, Often you're actually probably using more than what you would need. It's hard to get just that tiny little well, amount sure. unless you're using a pump that kind of gives you an automated dose of, of what you need. But no, it doesn't make a difference, the, the, uh, the volume. Mm -hmm. And anytime throughout the talk, please do uh, let me know if you have any questions. In terms of uh, filters or filter cups, <coughs> you can go a couple different routes. The first is going the reusable, or um, they can be found in this hard plastic version or glass. These must be sterilized before you're using and also between samples. And you can sterilize them in an autoclave or in a hot water bath set to about 98 degrees or in a boiling water pot. And when you do so, you wanna make sure that they're in there for at least 10 minutes. Uh, so that you ensure that each of them are um, absolutely sterile before going to the next sample. Initially, you're, it's going to be a little bit of a higher investment because each of the reusable cups are a little bit more expensive, but in the long run, it's going to be a more cost-effective uh, way to process multi many, many samples. It's a little bit more time-consuming because you are taking the time to wait for them to sterilize. And um, if that is uh, something that of um, important to you that you can't take the time to wait for them. An option is the disposable route. So what these do, um, they come in different versions as well, but they essentially come pre-sterilized. It's a low initial cost, so you're you're purchasing each of these um, um, separately, and you're not having to make a huge investment for the reusable ones. They save a lot of, uh, a significant amount of operator time because you're not having to wait for your cups to sterilize. Hmm? Excuse me. <laughs> it's a little loud. The other way. Um, and then some of these are also available with preloaded membranes such as these right here. So this is a cup that's gonna go right on top of your manifold that has a stopper already on it. Um, this holds 100 milliliters and it's graduated 20, 50, 100. It also has a membrane uh, in here already, uh, so you don't have to make a separate membrane purchase and you just pop that onto your, your plate and you're good to go. So whenever we have, um, whenever we're doing micro in, in the lab, we need to be, um, we need to think about the fact that we could also be introducing microbes into the samples inadvertently. Um, hence, aseptic technique, um, where you're flaming things, you're, you're spraying down your, your working surface with alcohol. Um, and some troubleshooting points, some points where you need to watch out for um, if you do start getting contamination into your plates are um, looking into, you know, is the equipment that I'm using, is it not sterile? Um, you know, maybe I didn't leave my filter cups in the water bath long enough. Um, 
forceps can be a, a source of contamination, you're essentially touching the membrane where your organisms are growing with your forceps. So you want to make sure that these get dipped in alcohol and flamed when you're handling your, your membranes. Uh, contaminated media can also be an issue. So as I mentioned earlier, if you are making your own media and you've poured a couple plates, these might be sitting in a drawer for a couple days. You want to make sure that when you go to use them, um, there, there isn't anything growing on here already. And a way to get around that or a way to, um, to eliminate this concern is to use the, the pre-sterilized uh, single-dose ampules. Non-sterile membrane discs, of course, as I mentioned, you want to make sure that you're using the sterile membrane discs. Um, and then although, although this doesn't happen very often, it is possible for you to have contamination come from your manifold onto your, um, onto your, your plates. Um, one reason why it's, of course, really important not to introduce any bacteria, but commonly um, that which is introduced are um, molds, and those molds are going to grow very quickly and they're going to essentially kind of take over your, your plate, obscuring or hiding some of the uh, wine microbes that we really are interested in, um, and uh, at which point we would be una unable to get a good identification and, and count. Uh, and the same goes for non-wine organisms. So these are organisms that are found in water, on our hands, it's just kind of in the environment, also known as environmental bacillus. Um, those can start growing quite quickly, and they can hide the organisms that we are interested in. So a couple examples of some bad micro tests. In this case, you have yeast and bacteria growing on top of each other. It's, it's uh, very difficult to get a good, accurate count. So in this case, what you want to do is check your sample size. Did I process more sample, more sample volume than I need? Um, maybe if I reduce that, I can actually get um, uh, colonies on here that I, can, that I can count and then identify. Uh, but another option to take a look at is, can I use um, selective media to reduce the population here? So can I, um, for example, use antibiotics in my media that can suppress the growth of Saccharomyces because I'm not interested in, in knowing if there's any Saccharomyces present. Rather, I'm only concerned if there are any um, any bacteria present, and they're going to grow in the presence of, um, of that antibiotic. Whenever you start seeing your membranes with a ring like this around the outside, um, this is often due to dirty funnels. So you want to make sure that when you are uh, sterilizing your filter cups that they're in there for uh, at least 10 minutes at 98 degrees or in a hot water, uh, boiling water bath. So as I mentioned, you don't need a lot in terms of, of plating. Uh, you can do this easily in, um, in your own lab. But the basics are right here. You need the manifold, the membrane, a funnel, a petri dish, your media, and an incubator. So essentially what you would do is you would um, collect your wine sample um, as cleanly as possible in a sterile container. You want to take your, um, your filter cup, in this case it does have the membrane already, and put it on top of your manifold. There we go. Put the wine over the top, turn on your vacuum, remove the filter cup. You're going to take your forceps, which have been dipped in alcohol and flamed and remove your membrane. Place this membrane on your Petri dish that's got auger on it already, and then incubate this. And this is gonna go in an incubator anywhere between 28 to 30 degrees for five to seven days. Another option is the microfill, and in this case, you wanna put your membrane right on top Filter cup goes on top of that, and you process your sample the same as you would here. Do you guys have any questions on um, the plating setup, what's needed, or any procedural questions? What about your airflow? When you're doing samples, sets like that, you want to follow the airflow, and you want to do it on your hood. 
Yeah, ideally you would have a laminar flow hood that's gonna avoid any um, airborne bacteria or mold from getting into your plating area. Um, often that's a very large expense and what I would suggest if you aren't able to have a laminar flow hood is um, avoiding having, um, avoid plating directly above air conditioning vents because uh, every time that gets kicked on, you know, the, the bacteria and the, or mold in the air starts moving around. Um, I would also avoid, you know, the door swinging open and closed while you're plating. So make sure people aren't kind of just kind of disturbing the air in, in the area that you're plating. Yeah. If you don't have a laminar flow, but putting it in a, in a fume hood uh, is actually a bad idea because you have a suction there. That means you're pulling all the mm -hmm. air from the room across mm -hmm. your membrane. So as a quieter place as possible. Uh, and then just don't sneeze on the pump all over, mm -hmm. and you know, be a little bit old with, with a little alcohol spray and so on, and you will be fine. But if you do have an air contamination, it's always mold, often the mold, and you'll have that fast growing and look like it gets beer. But they, and the molds don't grow in wine, so you know it's a, it's a room contamination. Okay. And I think a lot of people will do a hundred plating a year in a small little space, you know, once in a while, and they'll see, oh, I have one, one contamination. No, I mean, it's a good spot. If you have it on every third plate, you've got to change, uh, change the scene. Yeah. But often you can get away with surprisingly that I've even done it in, in the back of a car. <laughs> so, you, know, you, you, you can, for wine organisms, do it anywhere. Yeah. Uh, to that point, your technique is also really important. So spraying alcohol on your hands, wearing gloves, spraying your work surface with alcohol, um, all of those preventative measures that kind of fall into your aseptic technique in order to make sure that those outside bacteria and, and molds aren't getting into your, your samples. Mm -hmm. the incubation range of 28 to 30 degrees yes. over a period of seven days is, is pretty tight. How, how critical is it to stay within that range you know, over a seven day period? <clears throat> It's, uh, it's, um, the temperature, for example, is important, especially for consistency. You may well be able to grow these organisms at room temperature. After all, they are growing in, um, in the wine at you know, various temperatures. But if you want consistent results, you want to be able to take the plates out of your incubator on the same day every time and consistently know that you're going to have the right amount of growth, the, managing your temperature is important. Um, in terms of the days, that really all depends on your microorganisms. Um, you can pull out your plates after 48 hours and you know you're going to have Saccharomyces growing there, but you may, not, you may not be waiting long enough to have some of the other microbes that take longer. Um, and that's why we recommend waiting the five or maybe even seven days um, to, to pull them out. Does that answer your question? It does. Mm -hmm. I'm just not prepared to maybe I'm better off sending this out to you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, as long as you can. If you don't put into all that process, I'm very back to my So I imagine you don't have an incubator, is that right? No. Okay, yeah. You can still get results. You can still definitely get results. You just might have to be a little bit more patient in letting them grow. Mm -hmm. So now I want to talk a little bit more about monitoring these microbes in the winery, in your infrastructure. So what we have here um, is a little bit of data that comes from our uh, friend and colleague, Robert Tracy. He uh, conducts, uh, he has a lab and conducts sanitation audits. He works for BevTrack Mobile Quality Systems. So what he did is he um, audited several wineries on the West Coast large, medium, and small. And he essentially went around to these wineries after they had conducted their sanitation protocols and swabbed or took samples, various different samples from crush equipment, cellar equipment, oak cooperage, bottling equipment, infrastructure, so just kind of the basic infrastructure of the plant itself, atmosphere, uh, and then the water as well. And with that, he was able to compile information um, giving an average microbial load in the form of colony forming units 
And as we can see here, even after a sanitation procedure, we're still able to grow, um, to um, test these surfaces and find microorganisms growing. Um, by doing this audit, we're able to see the areas which, we, um, which most commonly harbor microorganisms. Uh, and those areas are the crush equipment, second is it winery infrastructure, cellar equipment, oak cooperage, and, and the list goes on. Um, and then as we know, these microbes are the ones that cause the wine spoilage organisms. They are found in our, in our winery. So whenever that wine comes into contact with our winery, that hasn't been sanitized properly, that's when we start getting um, higher risk of spoilage within our wine. So process sanitation, is, uh, these are the steps that we take in order to um, reduce unwanted microbes to at or below an acceptable level. And we do, it, do that via cleaning, sanitation, and sterilization. Sterilization specifically completely eliminates microbes from the process. Thankfully, in our wineries, we don't have to uh, worry about sterilization. Um, we don't have to worry about bacteria that could potentially cause harm to our consumers. That means that no pathogenic bacteria grow in wine due to the, uh, its acidity levels and high alcohol levels. Um, so although we don't have to worry about sterilization, our cleaning process still has to be um, structured in the form of cleaning, rinsing, and sanitizing. Specifically, you want to make sure that all contact surfaces be sanitized at startup, especially when we're talking about the bottling area. Hot water must be at 180 degrees, and the surfaces um, uh, that, this, uh, that uh, come into contact should also reach that temperature. Specifically, in the bottling line, you don't want to have it down for longer, uh, for long periods of time. Uh, at a maximum, I would, I would uh, make sure to keep them um, between a one to two hour uh, downtime before you have to actually re-sanitize your lines again. Regular audits um, are should be performed in order to make sure that the sanitation cycles are effective and that they're being carried out correctly, that you're using the right sanitizing agent for the right purpose. Um, and things that can be built into your, your um, regular audits are the use of ATP swabs. So these are swabs that um, can be used to get an instant reading. You can take them out, swab your surface, and then get a reading for ATP. So this, this doesn't mean that you're going to get um, a reading for how many microbes are present. Rather, it's how, uh, is there anything present that um, would allow or would give microbes um, the food or nutrients in order to grow and survive. So it's a little bit of a, you're not able to make a, quite of a direct correlation, but it's a really great tool to build into your, your regular audits. What is an acceptable RLU? You know that you mean the reading output from your mm -hmm. from your uh, ATP swab um, that has to be validated and um, and it really depends on what you're swabbing as well. So, for example, if you're swabbing a pristine, really clean stainless steel um, surface, you are probably going to get something like a zero, and that's a pass. Um, but if you're swabbing, for example, um, the uh, the bunghole on a barrel made of wood. You've got cellulose in there that has ATP in it. Even if that is very clean, you're still going to get some sort of reading. Um, you know, not to mention that it's also very difficult to, to clean wood. So how do you really know if there's nothing growing on there, even if you were to, to swab something? Um, but I would say that, um, that you really need to validate that along with um, some swabbing, which I'll, which, which I'll talk about, about in, a, in a minute. Yeah, and you had a question as well? Yeah, yeah, it really depends on what surface you're, you're working on. Um, and y y from unit to unit, it's going to change um, the different brand units um, and should really be validated with the, with the swab samplers. Should we read these 18 swabs? Is it 
So essentially, it's um, it's a handheld device that um, that is that is going to give you a digital reading, and then it's a swab that um, has a special reagent in it. Um, once that reagent is mixed and you swab your sample, that swab gets inserted into uh, the monitor, and that monitor essentially reads kind of the the bioluminescent output that's given by um, by that special reagent and then gives, gives you a reading. That reading itself, as I mentioned, can't be directly correlated to microbial counts. I understand. But, uh, yeah, okay. Okay, so it's, you have to buy this system. Absolutely. You have to buy the system and the swabs that come with it. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. I don't, I don't need to backtrack, backtrack, but on the last slide you said uh, if, your, if your line is down to like one to two hours, you want to be sanitized. What do you constitute being down? So let's just say your uh, the machine's down. Uh, between the one and two hours, but you run bottles through it. You can you, you, you be able to like run the line out of your filters and you know, uh, flow, if you will. Does that, does that count, or is that something to just put that question? Yeah, you know, I don't know. Maybe, Lauren, do you have a little bit more experience with that um, in terms of, you know, not only is it down, but wine is running through? The idea of emptying the full filler bowl. So in our case, we'll have like maybe the factor goes down. Uh, we have line capacity to be able to run cycles or you know, jog the filler, go a couple of rep revolutions, keep the line flow going so that you don't get growth, or that you keep passing line through so it's not sitting for that period of time. I would say, you know, that that may not necessarily constitute as line being down. It's just your packaging part of it that's that's not functioning at the moment. So if you're moving if you're moving wine. That's, it's, it's active, um, and it's only in the case where wine is still, that, I, that, uh, that if it's over two hours, you, you'd want to consider resanitizing. Because you're presenting, from, when the wine's not moving, you're presenting conditions that would give it you know, oxygen, the ability to grow populations of the <laughs> And again, I would say that's influenced by the sugar. The NTP swabs, we, uh, we use them a lot to validate our sanitation. It's not so much of the absolute number at the end, but it's how much of a decrease we see from before and after sanitation, for example. So it's a good way to, uh, to validate your, uh, your systems. <coughs> so you actually will take a swab before, before sanitation and after. And after. So that's, that's, a, that's a really swab great technique, swab. absolutely. Um, either that or in conjunction with some actual microplating. Absolutely. Yeah, that's work here, right? okay, we need to do another sanitation with so much decrease. And that's how you should really establish what is the, the ATP label in the wiring conditions that we're And that may answer this question too. How long does it take by testing to say how long does it take for us to start some of the mission and that help determine the downtime tolerances? Um Yes. A way to validate the ATP and get a feel for what numbers you want is also to combine it with like the microfill that you showed before that you do a cotton swab on an area and uh, pick up any microorganism you have, you shake it in the buffer and plate the buffer and get a count and then you compare that to an ATPase number and then because we're not sterile but just sanitized so there is some tolerance towards organism and it doesn't have to be like a surgery room here. The, uh, you will have to make some decision, we can give some general input, but it's not like, oh, are you above five, then you're like a horrible person. There's no strict uh, numbers on that. And I think the ATP sticks only using the numbers very a lot, depending on where we are in the process and what style of process it is. And I took me a while to get to terms with the whole, you know, 80 is okay here, and 10 is what I need there. And you have to uh, to put some effort into making the ATP swap work. You do, and, and along those lines is you have to start collecting that data and starting and, and looking at that data to kind of make sense of it. Because you are going to say, in one area, this is an acceptable level, but in this other area, it's not acceptable. Um, and that kind of ties into these regular audits. It's um, temperature checks, visual checks, it's uh, procedure checks, and uh, and making sure that you're going through the list and and, and essentially um, doing your swabs, and then and then making sure that 
uh, the results of that plating um, is uh, if, it's, if you're getting positive hits, that you're going back to those areas, uh, even if it's not gonna be that same day, but you're gonna retrain your sanitation crew, you need to um, work on this a little bit more, select a different cleaning agent perhaps. So again, kind of falling into the, this uh, regular audit um, system. Um, and as I mentioned, some tools. We talked about the ATP swabs already. The swab samplers, I'll, um, they look like this. And I'll tell you a little bit about, uh, more about these in a second. Um, air monitoring. Um, this can be used to test ambient air contamination. And you can do this um, especially when you're concerned about air within your plating area, for example. You can definitely test out your, um, your ambient air. Or if you're concerned about air uh, contamination um, in your bottling area. After all, you know, you're subjecting the wine to, um, to the atmosphere, putting it in the, in the bottle, and then closing it up. So that's kind of the last step where, um, that very critical step where you could uh, introduce um, organisms into, into the wine, even from just the atmosphere. Um, also want to let you know that standard plating that, like the routine that I showed you just earlier, can be performed on sanitation water uh, as well as, as raw water itself to make sure is my, raw, my water source um, clean enough for me to actually be you know, cleaning, uh, um, cleaning with it. So these selective swabs, what they are is a membrane. So it's a membrane just like these guys right here. And that membrane is mount mounted onto a paddle. This paddle has dehydrated media inside. So um, once it comes into liquid, into contact with liquid, uh, that media is then able to um, grow organisms. And you want to get it in conjunction with this <coughs> swab. So essentially what I have here is a Q-tip and a small volume of sterile saline buffer. What I would then do is open up my swab. This is wet. I'm going to uh, streak it across the surface that I'm interested in. And as long as your uh, streaking method is consistent, that's, that's essentially the most important thing. You're going to be streaking different um, surfaces. So if it's a stainless steel surface, you want to pick a spot that's maybe four centimeters by four centimeters and be consistent every time. Uh, if you are checking your, um, for example, the, a wooden bung, you want to circle it around, I don't know, a total of four times, for example. Uh, same with uh, corker jaws, for example. How many times am I going to circle around there? And what I would then do is put it back into the saline buffer, shake it up so that those microorganisms kind of come off of the, um, the swab itself. This can then be poured into um, your filter cup and filtered through your membrane or more convenient you can actually just take this paddle and put it in with your buffer shake this up and put it directly into your incubator so this is going to be um, put into your incubator you'll pull it out just as you would any other plate and you're now able to identify the microorganisms and get a rough uh, count as well Any questions about the swabbing tools? So whenever you start using these tools within your winery, you're able to do what we call hotspot mapping. With the routine audits that you're doing and the uh, swabbing techniques, you're able to then um, track any contamination points that um, come up more often, focus your improvements, and start creating these checklists or checkpoints um, during and after sanitation. So these are the spots that you're going to come around and swab with, uh, with the ATP uh, and make decisions on the spot or also swab with your, with your um, samplers. So a couple of things to watch out for when we are um, going through our sanitation in the winery, um, forgetting to open up all the valves. Uh, or not closing the valves while they're still under flow or pressure, not sanitizing the tops of the containers, specifically just areas that are hard to reach that 
you don't think about um, all that often. Um, the failure to reach 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, failure to uh, clean the outside of the filling spouts or not using enough uh, adequate um, water flow as well. Common contamination concerns are floor drains. So these are the, the, essentially the part of the winery that is most ignored, yet is a really, really big source for, for um, bacteria growth and, and contamination. Many of these drains have a positive pressure as well, which <coughs> tend to push microbes up and out, and especially of concern if these drains are in your bottling area. Unfortunately, many lines are also uh, designed so that sampling is uh, located directly above the floor drains. So that's uh, something to, to watch out for in terms of, um, of, of the design of your um, uh, bottling area. And then I've got this fruit fly right here to remind me that um, the drains are not just an issue during bottling or in the bottling area. When you've got dirty drains within your winery, especially if it's harvest, uh, you've got fruit flies around also. They're, they're everywhere. They're going to land on your drains or anywhere there's um, contamination, and then they're going to land in your fermenters as well. They seem to love it and hover around the, the fermenter caps. So those are the, time, the things that we need to think about when it comes to um, contamination and why it's so important to make sure that, um, that your winery infrastructure really is uh, clean. Couple things to avoid within uh, within the winery and um, uh, the design of it are dead legs or long tees. Um, <coughs> you want to make sure that you're checking any old piping or, or recycled lines, looking at the filling spouts, any drip and drain lines, gas lines, uh, and addition lines as well. Anytime you have poorly performed or too infrequent of sanitations. This can start leading into the formation of biofilms. Biofilms are very difficult to remove. Um, they harbor and they start protecting um, microbes from sanitation. So even after you've, you've cleaned and sanitized, they can remain and introduce more and more microbes into the wine once, once wine comes in contact with these biofilms. Um, the, the, the key here, as with um, pretty much anything having to do with wine microbiology, is preventing them. Um, so you want to prevent them with thorough cleanings. Um, often it's been recommended to, um, to change your sanitizing um, and cleaning agents as well, another way to, to prevent them. In terms of processed water, um, untreated water can also be a major source um, of contamination. Um, some of the organisms that can that can come in from the, from the water specifically are these environmental bacillus or non-wine organisms. So if you start seeing a lot of that growing in your plates, definitely start looking at your, your water source. Um, water should be filtered um, with a 0.45 micrometer membrane um, filter. Um, a 0.2 membrane filter is also going to eliminate everything, everything out of, out of there. Uh, chlorine dioxide also helps eliminate some uh, microcontamination within the water. In terms of sampling, whenever you are sampling, you want to make sure that um, the wine that you're collecting is representative of what's in the tank. Um, in the process of collecting the sample, if there's a lot of um, microbial contamination in that sample valve, you've now, you now have a sample that's not representative of what you have in there. Um, so you want to make sure that that sample valve is, is sprayed with alcohol, uh, that you let some flow out before actually collecting into a, um, a sterile container as well, then taking it back into the lab. Not only that, but after you take your sample, you want to make sure that that sample is then cleaned up because that can then, leaving wine or um, especially juice during harvest, is definitely going to harbor more and more bacteria there. A couple ways to, um, to avoid that is the use of sanitary valves, um, specifically this valve right here. These are often, often used in the pharmaceutical industries, um, and they're specially designed in order to um, collect samples in a more sanitary manner and also make sure that, um, that you can clean them a little bit better. 
So lastly, I wanted to talk about the Millipore Easy Flow System. Um, this is a system that's based on this bioluminescent technology. And the basis behind it is for you to be able to do um, your plating as usual, but get results in one third of the time that it would take for traditional microbiology. It's based on traditional microbiology techniques. You're gonna be filtering your wine, just as I showed you earlier with the plating demo. Uh, but then with the introduction of this special reagent and this special um, visualization or UV box, um, allowing you to, uh, to get early readings essentially. Anybody who works in the lab knows that you've got production people knocking on your door saying, can I get an early reading? Can I release this product? And then as a production manager or winemaker, you're also under pressure to release product and get it to your consumer's hands um, um, more faster or, or quicker. So this is, a, this is a way to do that. As I mentioned, you're gonna perform your um, current uh, plating process as you normally would. So what you have um, then is a plate which you've incubated. Um, you can pull it out as early as 16 hours if what you're looking for is yeast. Um, that time really is something that needs to be validated. But you can pull it out, uh, say if you've uh, validated time of uh, two days, for example. Pull it out and what you do is then you take this special reagent and this is a reagent that helps you um, with that bi um, bioluminescent reaction. What you would do is you add a couple drops into a petri dish that has this absorbent pad in it already. And then you would take the membrane from the, from the plate that you've just incubated and you would aseptically transfer this to the petri dish, incubate this for only 30 minutes and that's the time that it takes for the bacteria that are starting to grow on the membrane that you can't visually see because they haven't gotten large enough to create visible colonies. But what they do is they start absorbing the reagent and once you place it in the box after the 30 minute incubation time, open this up, place the plate in here, you're then able to visually see um, the results. And what I see here are bright spots, indicating that's where uh, future colonies are, are going to be forming. So here you can count what the, what the number of colonies, or you can also use this camera and visualize them on the computer, and I'll show you that right now. So this is a system that you would use, and this is essentially what it looks like, but I can capture that picture again takes a couple moments to take the picture, send it over to the computer program I'm using. And there you go. Then what you can do is take your mouse and click on each of the colonies and start counting. Now you've just cut back your incubation time <clears throat> and you're able to have results um, much, much faster. Not only that, but if you're interested in taking that same um, taking that same membrane and re-incubating it so that you can actually see the colonies and, and, and get an identification. You're able to remove it from the pad that you placed it on and place it back onto your, your auger. So that means that the, the media that you're using is non-destructive. Uh, it allows for the growth of these organisms to, to start um, growing again once it's in the incubator. Um, question I got is, is it selective? Is it going to tell you if it's bacteria or yeast? And um, the bioluminescent reagent does not distinguish between those, but what you're doing is you're actually um, plating on selective media. You can plate it on the typical media that you're using um, and then getting, getting a reading on, uh, on the unit. So it's just growth. Um, presence, absence, yes. But at the same time, if you are using selective media, you already have an idea of whether it's yeast or bacteria. Mm -hmm. But you can't decide what kind of yeast or what kind of bacteria. Right, you won't be able to say, is this Enococcus or is this Lactobacillus? Typically, you find either one, though, and it's still bad. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, and you have a question also? 
Lars, do you know if mold will show up? I would imagine, yes. I would imagine it's true. But again, mold is an handling issue. It's not a wine issue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Unless you're making uh, alcohol-free wine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I would say that uh, it's going to process the, the ATP the same way, and, and it, would sh it would obviously show up. Not just that, but mold is also going to grow much faster. And you may end up seeing mold uh, anyway. It's going to grow a lot faster. Yeah, so the advantage to this is especially for those organisms that are slow to grow. Yeah. Um, I've really gotten to kind of the conclusion of, of my presentation. So if you guys have any questions on, on the bio uh, flow or any other part of the presentation, I can answer that. You mentioned that, uh, I guess my question is on the bottom line, how often should you pull a bottle? Uh, you know, that depends on how many, on, on how fast you're, you're going. Some people will pull a sample um, during breaks, so before and after, or after breaks. <clears throat> um, so be that mid-morning, lunch, and afternoon break. Uh, if you're processing very, very fast, you want to sample probably every hour, or even more frequently, but every hour. So really, it, it depends on... Um, on how many samples are going through. Also, um, you know, at what point can you um, essentially, it's gonna, it's, what it's going to do, it's going to help you make a decision as to the product that can be held and the product that can be released. So it, it depends on kind of that, um, that medium also. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Um, I definitely invite you guys to come up and take a look at the unit, look at the top. It's, uh, it's a much different view than this. It's a really pretty green fluorescence that, uh, that you see from the top. Um, and then take a look at the plates. You'll see that the plates, you know, don't, ha um, the colonies just aren't very visible, but once you put it in there, they just shine. Um, come up and an ask any other questions that you might have and take, a, um, take my business card. They're sitting up here. Um, and you have a question also. Yeah, how accurate, or how accurate are the uh, selected media? Yeah, well, for example, um, if you're going to be plating for Brett, you're probably adding cyclohexamide. Cyclohexamide is going to suppress the growth of um, Saccharomyces yeast, and, um, and Brettanomyces is going to grow. But bacteria can also grow on that. It's going to be up to you to differentiate the, the bacteria colonies from the Brett colonies. Um, Thankfully, it's really easy. The, the, the yeast are just creamy, white, and much larger as opposed to the bacteria. Um, but it, they do work very well. Um, if you start overloading it with a lot of organisms, if, you, if it was um, a sample with a lot of Saccharomyces yeast, it's not going to be enough to knock back the population. Um, and, and in that case, it won't work. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> One of the questions I was having is, how do you know exactly what it is you're looking at? I mean, you got selective media. Mm -hmm. Is there a library of pictures somewhere that you can compare? Yeah, you know, we actually have a booklet, and I'm not sure if we brought one with us, but um, if you go onto our website, there's a really um, great book that has great pictures, pictures of what the yeast colon what the colonies look like, and what the bacteria look like under the microscope that can help you identify it. And it's this book that that um, that Lauren's holding up. I, I use it a lot. I reference uh, back to it to see um, what, the, what the bacteria look like under the microscope. Absolutely. There are customers that really, really love the patients and they break Do any of you guys here have it? I know a lot of people have the book. Yeah. Yeah. Should we buy it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, with that, thank you. Really, really appreciate you guys coming out.